Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin, executive editor with the Mises Institute. And with me, of course, is my co-host, Tho Bishop. And uh, let's talk about the debate today. Uh, well, quote unquote, debate, uh, whatever it is you want to, it was a display Funeral. of... <laughs> funeral last night <laughs> well yeah the analysis certainly that came after that we could certainly describe it that way and so yeah we'll cover all of that in fact i'm not even sure there's that much that occurred during not too much in terms of actual words said during the debate that there's much to discuss about but uh we'll get to that in a second first i want to just make sure and invite you all to attend our supporter summit 2024. That's coming up in October. That's October 10 through October 12th. The Supporter Summit is where our donors can come and uh, spend a weekend uh, with our speakers, with all of our top speakers. There's a whole slate of lectures and talks and uh, brunches and that sort of thing. And that's going to be in Hilton Head, South Carolina this year. And so we, we try to have these in very nice locations. And so if you're all in, at all interested, go to Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G, click on events, and just go down to Supporter Summit 2024, and you can register now. And uh, yeah, I've been going to these for uh, a while now that I've been working at the Mises Institute. And uh, they're generally actually pretty relaxing. And it's it's in a nice atmosphere, so it's it's not like you're in just uh, a bunch of classroom settings the whole time. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it. If you haven't been, check it out this year. That's Supporter Summit 2024 at Hilton Head, and that is October 10 through 12. And this is a special one because we will have our world debut of our documentary, Playing With Fire, Money Banking in the Federal Reserve. Um, We've had put a lot of work into this documentary. It's going to be great. Inflation, obviously, number one issue out there. So, again, a special aspect to this year's Supporter Summit that I think anyone there will definitely be enjoying. Yeah, I forgot about the uh, the video trailer. Yeah, you will be the first people to see the full trailer. So far, it's just been well, like the 30-second the teasers. Yeah, well, the full documentary will come out the Supporter Summit. Trailer coming out very soon. Ah, that's right. July 1st is when the full trailer's coming out, and then we've got the full documentary coming out at the event. So it's it's a big year. And this, of course, is a follow-up documentary uh, to... We had one that we recorded in the 90s and has just boatloads of views now. It's just... It's, it's never gone away. Like, it just continues to get views uh, just because of its content on uh, the Fed. But, of course, it, it doesn't cover any of the events since the Great Recession and all of that. So we've updated it. Uh, for uh, younger audiences. And uh, I think uh, that that's exciting, and I think people will be pleased with the finished product on that, because, of course, Tho and I have been looking at clips that uh, have been produced. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, the production value is nice. It's, it's new, and so it's a good follow-up to the older 25-year-old video. All right, well, let's talk about the debate. Now, we had, <laughs> we had planned ahead of time, hey, we'll get together and we'll talk about the debate for Radio Rothbard. And, uh, to, uh, you know, I don't think we quite knew what was going to happen. We thought maybe they were going to have Biden on uh, cocaine or something. I don't know. That was going to have him looking real good for the debate. Yeah. Well, apparently the that... Hunter stash. Right. <laughs> that apparently didn't work. Um and because this was a terrible performance uh, for Biden. And if you look at the analysis that followed up the debate, they pulled together all of these uh, big Democrat Party people who are really just mostly like CNN people, right? There's basically no line anymore between high-ranking Democrat operatives and uh, CNN talking heads. So they're, they're all just talking about what do we do now? Um, because Biden clearly, he he doesn't know what's going on. I mean, he, he was talking about his his golfing handicap at one point, and another point declared that we beat Medicare. Uh, I don't I don't even know what's going on. If only, uh, right, <laughs> right. I wish. And so I, I guess I will just start out with you, though. I mean, what's yeah. what's the meaning of this debate? Well, yeah, this is fun to jump into because, you know, usually this, the, one of the difficulties, particularly for us, the Institute, right, is that 
you know, we, we want to talk about the debate because that's going to be a big news item. Usually debates are all hype and then it happens and then nothing matters, right? Debates typically are meaningless. You could argue perhaps, I think in 2020, Trump's performance, particularly that first debate, I don't even remember the second debate, if there even was a second debate. Um, I just remember the first one and it was a bad performance from Trump because he was angry. He didn't want to be there. He kept stepping over Joe. Um, and it, that, I think that was probably a neg negative for Trump going into all the craziness that happened in November. This one, though, I mean, it, it might be the most meaningful debate in quite some time. And it's difficult for us because, you know, it's not like we're going to be dissecting a lot of substance here. It's not like there's some profound arguments on economics or foreign policy, though obviously those topics did come up. And, you know, the only gems of truth came when one side was criticizing the other for some stupid policies that they were pushing. And, and typically from that perspective, right, you know, Biden talking about how you know, tariffs or, you know, tariffs raise prices for the middle class. And that's that's a, a valid point. It's a true point there. But none of that really matters, right? You know, you're, you're not going to get a lot of substance from these people. Um, again, you don't want to debate golf with Donald Trump. So I don't know even why that, that door was open on, on Biden's side. Like that's one area where, trust me, yeah, that, say what you will, at least the man has a hobby. And that is one area you're not going to win a debate on. Um, but this is, this is an absolute free fall for Biden. I mean, you're seeing it with, with, the, the gambling odds, right? The predicted odds of Biden winning. I mean, they are crashing down. Some of that is Trump rising. Some of it is now alternative Democratic candidates going up in the polls with the idea. And now they've obviously got to replace this guy. And so I think there's a few things to unpack here. One is just how bad was Biden's performance. The more important thing is the aftermath behind it. And from that conversation, you can go two directions. One is the cynical path, which is this was always the plan. They deliberately had the debate this early on so that they could do the old switcheroo um, and that this was a, a carefully you know, plotted thing to get an outcome that you know the powers that be wanted months ago, which was having a different candidate on the board. And I, I really don't, I, 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 right now, this is this, maybe I'm still too naive. Maybe I'm still too naive. I don't really think that's what's going on here. I think what it is is just like this rare, like people are, are people on that in that that echo chamber, people on that side. I mean, we're not talking about you know activists on the sidelines, right? We're talking about the powers that be within the Democratic Party, the donor class, uh, the the politicians, the the, the punditry class, all of them aligned, seeing something so obviously public that. Should have been obvious, right? You had the Wall Street Journal article about how Biden Biden's struggling behind closed doors, and everyone was pouncing on that, saying, "Oh, this is absurd." You know, the reporters are hacks, yada yada yada. You had the 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 special investigation probe, right, that said, "Well, we're not going to prosecute this guy because we fear he's going to come across the jury as a well-meaning elderly man that is very forgetful and senile," and yada yada yada. And I I I, I tend to side at this point in the in the idea that this this I mean, incredibly uniform. Incredibly uniform backlash is a spontaneous, just finally a recognition of the reality and where they actually find themselves in. And the reason I say that is because the the mechanisms that would come into a replacement, we're going to just jump into that, I think, to, to start off with, um, because it's that, that is the story, is that... You know, Ultimately, the only real way structurally to get out of Biden 2024 from the Democrat side is for him to drop out. The, 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 the amount of, of unclaimed delegates, the amount of super delegates and things like that, the, the rules have changed for that party. Um, you know, the, the, there's, there's not that many unclaimed delegates out there. I think it's like 4,000 total, there's like 700 and something that, you know, could theoretically just change without any sort of, of mechanism for that. And what you have, and again, I, and I, I think in some ways this is a perfect illustration of just the, the state of modern politics, is that, you know, you have someone in power who is so self-absorbed, so delusional, and tragically perhaps, but a, a self-created tragedy is that this is a man who, I mean, you think about Joe Biden, the individual, right? This is someone who has never been 
a, a particularly talented individual. This is a man who has spent his entire adult life, for the most part, in government, you know, in the Senate. Yeah, yeah I, I, I love the lines. Like, oh, when, when I first entered in, I was the, uh, yeah, the, all the conversation about me was I was the youngest guy. It's like, how old was, how long ago was that, Joe? <laughs> It's like yeah, yeah, you know, back, back, back in the back in the uh, the '60s, yeah, you are you were a young kid back then. That's kind of how the way math works. Um, <laughs> but you know the the but, but this is a man who who abandoned his kids right after his wife died, right? Um, whose the kids did not have a good relationship with his his new wife. Uh, someone whose family, I mean, on display with Hunter Biden in particular and all of the, the sorty details with, with that whole situation, right? I mean, this is not a good family man who has built a good family. And he is not surrounded by people who, you know, the, the entire world around him is not someone who is going to have, he doesn't have that support system to, 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 to have a humble take the keys away moment around him. And this is a guy that, that has lusted for power his entire life, who, who has deluded himself into thinking that he alone can save democracy, right, by, by beating Trump. Um, thinks, and perhaps not <clears throat> unreasonably so, that, that his brand of the Democratic Party, undermined by the insanity of the people that have been in the administration, right? But that, that, that he represents a, a older, more moderate form of the Democratic Party that can win a large port, that, that can win nationally, right? That, that I fully believe that Joe Biden, in his mind, to the ability that he's able to think critically about this sort of stuff, believes that he is the best person to go against Trump and that he is the only person that can save this thing. And last night was a wake-up call to all these power brokers that finally what has always what has been evident to everyone that has not been so far up that you know up, up that uh, that creek so someone who obvious to anyone who is not outside of the the perverse echo chamber of dc politics um that this guy is simply not equipped to govern now much less than for for four more years and just the, the the scales falling from the eyes, and you know you, you see these pundits out there. I mean, I, this I've never seen a more uniform response from the mainstream media in a position that makes their position harder to hold than now. I mean, everything you know, the the for for those that do not uh, uh, dabble within kind of media, kind of the the, the media echo chamber of DC politics, Joe Biden's favorite show. Is Morning Joe, um, which is has been the biggest cheerleader. It's a, it's a morning cheerlead for Biden, and even today, Morning Joe, which I mean, you had people talking last night that, that follow this sort of stuff, and and they, they were expecting them to wake up and, and and to attack CNN right for not holding Trump accountable to try to create sort of a proxy sort of argument out there beyond the obvious line of Biden had a horrible debate. And even Morning Joe was having conversations about one, needing to take the keys away, that this is panic mode. That they, I mean, you, you had MSNBC commentators last night talking about how the rules of the Democratic Convention are being passed around to try to figure out ways out of this. So I don't think this was planned. I really don't. Again, I, I'd be naive in there. I don't think this was a, a 40 chess move to get a desired outcome that was you know, looked at upon six months ago. I think that this is genuinely a period of shock, surprise, and, and angst. That we have put up a, a dry husk of a man, a, a decrepit mummy, and that for for and since they buy everything about how Trump is going to destroy democracy, and be a dictator, be bloodbath, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, like all all the all the all the memes out there that the left has about Trump, that they are now really kind of facing the reality that they they have created this horrible, you know. You know, proto Hitler narrative about Trump 2.0, and the alternative that they have brought to the table is the man that we saw last night. And so again, usually debates don't matter. Usually we're trying to parse content from you know trying to just laugh at the the stupidity of the arguments and and kind of you know, talk about the the intellectual decay of the American class. But this debate, I think, actually matters not because of the substance involved, but you know, kind of you know. You think back to the, the, the Nixon JFK debate and, and the, the the value of television. You think about you know on another side of side of the, the equation, the way that Reagan was able to overcome similar concerns about age with his sort of quick quips um, back in the day. And again, obviously not commenting on the substance and and you know, 
intellectual rigor of, of any of those past campaigns. This has the same dynamic to the extent that American politics is governed by emotion and aesthetics and the way that your average person sitting or you know, that, that does not follow this stuff closely, how do they feel afterwards? And again, I've never seen such a, a widespread unanimous opinion that what happened last night was an absolute devastating you know, train wreck that you cannot get out of. And uh, it's, it's fascinating to watch just the entire establishment on fire today, particularly given something that was so predictable. <laughs> Well, yes, I was shocked by the response of the CNN panel after the debate, like you were, because there was no real position of, oh, well, this wasn't as bad as it seemed, or, right, oh, I thought, by I disagree with you other guys, I thought Biden did pretty well. There wasn't any of that. It was basically uniform, this was a disaster. Yes, there were some people in social media who were obviously like, they, they're paid to do like marketing or something for the administration because they just they were live tweeting the debate about how Biden was killing it and all of that. And at this point, the whole thing just makes you feel more and more like you're living in the Soviet Union and just the blatant lies that which like nobody believes these lies except some of the people who were telling them. I don't even think all of the people telling the lies believe the lies. And, and we're being told how sharp and incisive and how a meeting with Joe, this is what Mallorca said, right? How a meeting with Joe Biden is intimidating because you have to prepare so much for the meeting because Biden is asking so many probing questions and is so on top of everything intellectually. Everybody knows that's BS. And, but that's what the administration was talking about is just how great Biden is and how just uh, on top of his game he is, and then you watch this debate and you know it's pure, pure fantasy. And I have the same uh, issue as you, as I'm, and this has been going on, of course, for years and years, is I'm always trying to determine, okay, is this, this thing going on, is this due to evil or is it due to stupidity and incompetence? And a lot of the time it turns out very often it turns out it is just stupidity. And <laughs> so it is, I think, often you, you should probably attribute to stupidity the things that come off as probably like an evil plan. Yeah, not that the stupid people aren't evil. Uh, yeah, that, they're the, that the, too. The, the, the evil is secondary to the stupidity. <laughs> they're stupid and evil. And, and you look, you, again, it comes back to the Soviet Union. You can see these people who they had total political control. The party had total control. And you thought, oh, well, why don't they just put somebody else in? other than, say, Brezhnev or some of these other guys in the 80s who were just doddering old men who clearly were not up to the task. Why did they put those guys in who died then soon after, caused more instability in the Politburo? And th that th if that was their secret plan, if that was the... And these are people used to carrying out conspiracies in their government against their own people. But that was the best they could do in the 70s and the 80s in the Soviet Union as everything got worse and worse and obviously their country was going down the tubes. They had the ability to carry out politically any conspiracy they wanted with basically no repercussions from the general public, which had none of the guns and none of the ability to really uh, uh, oppose the regime. But you can see how what they did was they they just kept putting in people who clearly weren't up to the task. And then at the end, they have Gorbachev in there who can't manage the situation. And then in a panic, they try to do a, they try to pull off a coup at the very end. They try to remove Gorbachev, who they had put in there. And so you can see how these things spiral out of control, that you can have people who are totally in control of the media, totally in control of the regime, but in the end, they're not good enough. They're not smart enough to manage the situation. And I could see how that's just the, the situation in the United States right now. You've got all these people who have clawed their way to the top. They, they clearly regard the general public as a bunch of morons who uh, should not we should not listen to them. They don't know what's going on. They can't appreciate how uh, how things work in Washington. And so they should all just sit back and expect and accept whatever it is that the regime has planned for them. And so they trot up their 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 white knight, Joe Biden, and the public can see what a joke it all is. And I think it's as you say, 
after so many nights at cocktail parties with just other people who agree with you, after so many days of just convincing yourself that you're either with Joe Biden or you're evil, they thought, well, clearly most people are going to agree with us in the end that they can't uh, support Trump in any way, that Biden is clearly the guy. And then they, they look at what's going on publicly in front of the public's eyes and they think, oh, maybe, maybe things aren't working out as we thought. Maybe, maybe Joe doesn't look as brilliant as we thought he did. And so I agree with you. It's, uh, I don't think it's part of a plan to replace Joe. And we've discussed this before, is how you have to appreciate that while Joe Biden probably doesn't know what's going on, he has specific human beings behind him who want to remain in power. And these are different human beings from people who want some other candidate to be in power. So the people behind Biden are going to fight tooth and nail to keep him in there as long as they can. And they're fighting. They're trying to keep Biden in there, but everybody else and, and a lot of people, other, uh, other high ranking people in the party are thinking, OK, well, maybe it's not as bad as we thought. We can live with these Biden people for another four years. But after last night's performance, they're thinking, uh oh, if we let these Biden people get away with it again, it's just going to be a disaster for the party. So they're, they seem to be fighting back now. But the question is, what can they do? As you note, and we used to study this in basic political science stuff, uh, the way the Democratic Party is put together, they have all these super delegates, and it's very much, in spite of all of their claims to be pro-democracy, the Democratic Party is run by the elites. The elites determine who the candidates are. It's actually m more democratic in that sense in the Republican Party, where there's actually a chance in hell that an insurgent candidate could get the nomination. Unless, of course, you're uh, Ron Paul, in which case they all get together behind the scenes and change the rules to make sure that Ron uh, doesn't get a speaking spot and that he doesn't have a chance to rally his troops and all of that. Uh, but the Democratic Party doesn't even have that problem. They just know who's going to get the nomination because of the superdelegates. But um, a lot of the people who are superdelegates, uh, I mean, Hillary Clinton's a superdelegate, that sort of person. Uh, the, I think they're losing. <laughs> they're really starting to get concerned about renominating Joe Biden. So everything seems to be really up in the air at this point uh, in terms of the nomination later this summer. And I really have no idea what their plan B and C are going to be going forward. Because yeah, I mean, Biden is supposed to be kind of a caretaker government, and it's worked pretty well for the Democrats to the extent where, again, you, you've had various parties, you know, various factions within the Democratic Party that have had, basically, they've been able to carve up various positions and things like that. So like, again, you know, even, you know, I, I think individually, I think we've talked about this in the past, I think individually, if, if you were to, to put them under truth serum, right, I think Joe Biden is to the right, you know, however you want to define that. I, I think Joe Biden individually is less radical in his worldview than, say, Barack Obama was. But the Biden administration has been far to the left, the Obama administration, because of the people underneath that make up the administration itself. And so you had a lot of people that were perfectly fine going along with Biden as the caretaker figurehead of government because you had various interested groups that carved up, you know, you have, you have, you have crazy environmentalists on and, you know, in, in certain camps that can do stuff that they want to do. You obviously have had, you know, just insanity on the cultural side with elevations of particular personalities and positions on, on one side. You've had the, the State Department has been safely put back within kind of the Obama sphere of influence there and yada, yada, yada. And so they are perfectly fine with having an uninspiring figure Again, thinking that that was just the easiest way of continuing it. And I think they also kind of convince themselves that you know, Trump himself is so, you know, uh, offensive to a large swath of the population that you know, as long as Trump is the nominee, um, you know, a lot of the you – know, there, there wouldn't be too much um, nitpicking, right, about some of the, the weaknesses there because, you know, Trump – obviously Trump can't get elected because he's a, he's a crazy man, right? And we're we're going to throw some criminal convictions at him and yada, yada, yada. And all that, all that went up in smoke last night. And so now what we have is a you know, is, is this, this this boogeyman figure on the rise, and they're freaking out. And, and I guess it, it does deserve a conversation. Okay, well let, let's let's say the unlikely does happen, and that is that you have Joe Biden who is able to sell himself on the narrative that for the best part, you know, 
And in, in order to, to save the democracy and save the republic, I am going to do this act of charity and I am going to step down. Let's say you're actually able to get him to move off his spot. Um, then who fills that void afterwards? And, you know, of those figures, right, you know, the, the popular ones are people like Gavin Newsom, um, you know, in, in California, who, who I mean, needs to be said. I mean, it, it's, it's I, I, I think that his star um, was tarnished a little bit um, after his debate with uh, DeSantis last year, um, just because I think a lot of people expected Gavin. I mean, when you think about Gavin Newsom, right, for, for anything else you might say, you think about a talented slimy salesman, right? You, you think about someone who, who excels in the, the optics and the ability to think on his feet. And when you think about Ron DeSantis, you do not think about a particularly talented debater, right? Like he is not a particularly charismatic guy. I mean, I think that played itself out in the, 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 in the, the his, his attempt to, to dethrone Trump on, on the Republican primary, right? And, and Newsom lost the debate with DeSantis and like not even kind of keeping up on that stage. And so I, I, so if that is supposed to be one of your big selling points, right, you're not trying to sell necessarily the California vision for America, right, but you, you want a talented, um, you know, figurehead politician, you know, how does, how does that really sell? He also has an issue with kind of internal capital. Um, Newsom and, and Obama world have never been particularly tight. Um, you know, you had you know, Newsom was always upset because Biden didn't, or because Obama didn't want to take pictures with him. Ironically, because of a big split over gay marriage back in the day. You know, this is ancient history now, um, where we are in 2024. But those internal relationships matter, particularly within the Democratic Party. Um, you, you have Kamala Harris, who you know is one of the least popular vice presidents in modern history. Um, they were certainly trotting her out there, um, and you had people talking about how great she was as a surrogate last night. So you know, do with that information what you will. And of course, then you always have the figure that will never go away. You have Hillary Clinton, who, in terms of wielding raw power within the organization of the Democratic Party, you should never underestimate her ability to pull some strings there. Um, um, you know, and then you can you know, throw a handful of of other governors out there, like Richard Whitmer and the like. But I mean, it, it, it's again. That entire conversation does not really begin in full until you have Biden willing to make that move. And it's interesting. I mean, the, the immediate spin from today, uh, again, the only spin is coming out of official Biden camp. It's not coming from proxies. Um, you know, it started off last night with about, I think, about you know, 25 minutes into it. You know, they finally they got word out. So, oh, well, you know, Biden sounds like a, a husk of a man because, you know, he had a cold. He had a cold. Uh, so okay, well, uh, yeah, uh, let's let's say that is true. Let's 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 pretend for a minute that that might be true. Okay, you, you you mentioned that beforehand, right? Don't know if that would really matter in terms of optics because the optics were so bad. But like you know, you could have set that you, if if you wanted the media to be a a, a helpful lapdog with that angle, you, you you feed it out early, right? This is not that particularly hard, right? So it's, they're, they're 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 playing behind already from from just the the pure unadulterated spin aspect of it. Uh, but you know, I, I saw you. Know, Comments from from Team Biden officials saying, "Oh well, Biden is obviously not going to drop out. In fact, he's going to be rested and ready for the September debate that's currently scheduled." Um, and so, so again, I mean, it, it is their their ability to defend right now. Um, again, it, it is Team Biden against the world, and they are usually not an isolated figure within that. Um, and again, it's going to be interesting to see the, just the continual fallout from it because. You know, again, it, it's it's interesting, um, and and I, I think this is illustrative of how just the news making process goes. But the extent to which CNN pundits, and, yeah, the, the entire panel of CNN pundits last night in the in the the, the recap, the, the MSNBC team, you know, all the all the media apparatuses around it, they were all talking about the same points, and that it, it wasn't that, that again, it was the it was big money donors saying, well, I, I might not, I might stop giving after this train wreck, right? Um, it, it's elected officials in the Senate right now. It is members of the House that fear that Biden on the ballot is going to hurt their chances of winning re-election, right? I, I mean, everyone was pulling. I mean, you know, the, 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 I, I don't know what sort of group chats they have going on between uh, uh, currently elected senators in the puncher class, but clearly, you know, they, they, they were they were in full operation last night. I mean, they, they were they were heated up um, last night because again, every single message. And, and that's why I understand the perspective of it looking like an orchestrated effort. Um, but again, I, I think that this was a raw reaction to, and again, it started off with, and I guess we should talk about some specific moments that came last night, but it started off from, I, guess, I think it was the first or second question 
where and, and, and you expect going into it, right? You, you, it's it's not that simply Biden stumbled on, on, you know, over his words, right? He he was doing that at the peak of his game, right? But it was that that first, I, again, it was his first or second answer where he he literally could not finish the point that he made. That I mean, it was it was a good 30, 45 seconds of just mumbling disorientation that ended up with that line, you know, I'm a, we 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 we. we we beat Medicare, right? Like, and and like the the fact that he couldn't even recover with with a brain fart there. Uh, that's I mean I was I was sitting in a room with with people from my church. Uh, I was trying to get a, get a, get outside of kind of a partisan pure sort of cheerleading section there, and we were I mean like that moment. I mean everyone in the in the room was just looking around, and you look online like that. That was from the from the very get go from that very moment. Um, you know, it's like this, this, this is, this is different. This is a different thing. Yeah. This is the sort of thing where you're suddenly get very, very quiet waiting for what's he going to say next? Because is this, is this period of mumbling going to end in a coherent sentence? And it didn't. And, and let's just be clear, right? My father's 83 years old. When he has a cold, he doesn't sound anything like Joe Biden. He can still complete sentences. Uh, and I mean, and also we should just note, right, that I, I don't want to hear anything about elder abuse here, right? This is a man who, when he was still in full control of his faculties, decided he was so important that he should run for president again, even though he was going to be 80 years old soon. Now, a normal person who's not a, a power mad psychopath, he wants to retire, spend time with his family. Uh, just, <laughs> just rest on his accomplishments throughout life and be a normal human being. But that's not how these people function. They're so obsessed with power that they're going to hang in there until the last second, no matter what. And so Biden deserves whatever criticism he gets. He's exactly where he thought he should be uh, a few years ago. And I, I don't have any sympathy for the guy. So, yeah, don't don't. Don't at me, bro, about how I should be treating uh, Biden as, as he's just a, a nice elderly man. He's not. He's an evil person who wanted to cling to power longer. And this is what he's doing. This is the outcome of that, because there are plenty of elderly people who are nothing like Biden and are normal, and they're, they don't end up in this situation. And, and this has been a trend. And again, and again, I'm not trying to make some sort of left, or blue versus red point here, I'm, but I, I think it does serve as a helpful illustration of the mindset of the sorts of people that have dominated American politics for quite some time. But it is worth noting that this is a trend now amongst Democrat leaders in particular, and, and as well as a handful of, of Republicans, is people that will refuse to step away, right? So you can think about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who... You know, clung, clung, you know, who, who refused to step down when Obama was president, right? If you're thinking about this from, if you really care about outcomes, if you care about outcomes more than yourself, and if you, your view on positive outcomes is shaped by the ideology of the left, Democratic Party, whatever, whatever word you want to use there, right? From, from, from a, an outside perspective, giving value-free analysis on what would you rather, what, what, what should you do? If you care about the, the the making sure that the government outlasts you in terms of keeping your ideology strong, Ruth Bader Ginsburg should have retired when Obama was still president. Instead, she narcissistically, and you know, hey, I'm, I'm glad she's gone. I'm glad that I, for for all my issues with, with Amy Comey Barrett, right? She's probably better than whatever Obama would have put up there, right? So take take that lesser of two evil approach there, but you. Know, she she could have retired then. She refused to give it up. Diane Feinstein was being wheeled around as a as a just a you know <laughs> similar to Biden, right? Until her dying days. Um, uh, you know, you you have, I mean, at, at least Nancy Pelosi gave up the, the speakership. I did not give up her position in Congress, but gave up her speakership a little bit earlier. So like, that's that's I mean Nancy Pelosi ends up being one of the more humble members of the powerful <laughs> left. Take that for what it's worth. Um, but like this is now repeatedly. Is that you have this mindset that 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 they are indispensable, that that their ego, their their attachment to power, is more important than their higher calling. And this this is this this should be a very uh, a, a white pill optimistic view for us as dissidents of power, because what these have demonstrated is that in real time, right, based off their own action, we see how 
shallow and, and superficial and, and narcissistic and again, all these aspects that often, more often than not, are responsible for the destruction of regimes more than some sort of grand ideological revolution. It's the personal failings of these folks that bring down powerful systems more as much as anything else. And it's the same personality trait that we've now seen repeatedly on display from some of these very, very powerful figures within the, the establishment, the, the political establishment. Um, and it's just fascinating to see it. Again, I, it, it's never played out so so vividly because, again, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg wasn't doing, you know, you don't, you don't have these, you, know, you don't have Supreme Court trials with a, a massive cable audience, right? Um, you know, this, this, is, this is it in, in peak uh, uh, mass demonstration form, but this is something that is not unique to Biden. This has been something that, and I, I don't know if, there's a, if it's a generational aspect, right? You know, we're going to have a larger conversation about you know, boomers and that sort of uh, a culture of entitlement that comes with that. Um, but again, this has been a repeated example of individuals more desiring to cling onto power than to even than to calculate longer standing legacies. And again, considering what they wanted those legacies to be, hey, I'm more power. You know, run, Joe, run. Well, and this also is an example. I think that helps our case that Biden's public humiliation wasn't part of a conspiracy. It was part of just ego of all of these people clinging to power as long as they could uh, because they're just they think they're the best and they they would never groom another younger person to come in and that's how you would know it was part of a competent conspiracy was if the, you had a group of people if all of these old people were really committed to the plan and to the ideal and they were behaving like a communist cell like we were all supposed to believe communists behave that they're all they don't have personal interests they're all committed to the party well, you wouldn't have guys like Mitch McConnell in there. Mitch McConnell would have brought up a protege and installed him in a power position and McConnell would have resigned. And that's not what happens is these guys, they don't bring up the next generation. In fact, there's a huge hole in, in the bench in terms of why aren't there guys in their 50s who are poised to take over. All those people are marginalized by the guys in their 80s. And this this is happening over and over again. And in the past, you did have some exceptions. You had like Strom Thurmond, who clung to his Senate seat until he died. But you take, for example, a counter example would be like Bob Dole, who I'm Lord knows I'm no big fan of Bob Dole. But the guy lived for a long time after he resigned from the Senate. And so he could have been like Mitch McConnell and just hung out in the Senate until his mid 90s and just refused to go. Uh, but he didn't do that because I think there was some sense that, hey, maybe maybe it's time to resign. But I think you're right. I think just in the last 10, 20 years, it's become more this idea that nope, uh, no, no man in his 50s is equipped with the brilliance of me, Mitch McConnell or me, Nancy Pelosi. And so they just never, ever leave. And you can see this played out, I think, uh, in, in most presidential situations where there's a second term. And I've often wondered why this doesn't happen all the time. Imagine this, though, right? If, if they were really committed to the plan, to the party, why not in your third year, in your seventh year as president, you resign so that the vice president can become president and then they have a year under their belt and they're now running for election as a incumbent. And in the way that the, the constitutional amendment is written in terms of limiting presidential um, uh, terms, you could even serve up to 10 years. And so if you just come in in the last year of a previous president, you could actually then serve, right, another eight years, and then you resign in year three. And then, so you could just keep it going like that, where your party is always the incumbent party, no matter what. There's never an open seat in the White House. Why don't they do that all the time? I guess just because of ego. What is kind of interesting is I, I think that you know, that has been a, a something in the back, but uh, one of the, the underlying narratives of who Trump is gonna pick as VP. Um, you know, there, there's, there was some rumors out there that he was going to announce last night. You know who who was going to be uh, that would been very apprentice you know, reality show like there. Um, obviously, did not happen. But that's been one of the conversations there because you kind of have, um, you know, looking at news reports, right? There's there's anywhere between three and five finalists, and based on those finalists, you can kind of see two different groups. Uh, you know, you've got 
you know, people that I would put into the category of sort of caretaker VPs, right? You have people that, that you know, individually they might have higher ambition, um, but I don't think would be widely seen as like obvious heirs afterwards. And so I'd be like the, the South Dakota or the, the North Dakota governor, uh, Doug Burgum um, and Ben Carson, right? I think Burgum probably has more ambition than Ben Carson um, in that regard. But like, that'd, be a, that'd be a kind of a feat seller VP. Someone's not going to, um, to, to take up the limelight from Trump. Um, they're there just to kind of be a loyal VP and to, to have a very fairly minimum impact, you would assume. Uh, people are not going to bring in sort of an army of staffers that are already living in D.C. and things like that. So that would kind of be just a kind of a, feats, a, 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 a seat filler position there. But you have a lot of people that want like a J.D. Vance because they view him as a young leader of kind of Trump age Republican Party stuff. And if you look at J.D. Vance, like he's, he's good on foreign policy relative to most. Has some economic issues that we would not be particularly happy about, um, but that that would be a reflection of kind of setting up that air dynamic. Um, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy um, is someone who you know, I'm not sure how how credible he is as a VP candidate. His his uh, the the betting data went, went way up uh, last week, which I found very interesting. But you know he's someone who would be kind of that air air apparent sort of dynamic. Um, Marco Rubio it would kind of be similar if you just look at age and his obvious ambition there. Um, now, you know, how that works out in terms of you know whether or not Trump would serve all four years and, and everything that goes in that, I have a feeling with Trump's ego, um, you know, I, I don't see him as someone who steps away from you know b- being a Cincinnatus by any means. Um, but but obviously with with Trump, you have the larger you know you, you have your own share of health and age concerns. You have um, obviously the the more 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 violent routes of of him not serving. Um, four years there, which is the way that everything else is is with <laughs> surrounding Trump. Um, but but I, it'd be interesting to see that calculation on the Republican side when it comes to that vice presidential question. Um, and and of course, this is something that that you know again when when you can even look backwards, right? The, the selection of Kamala Harris as VP, someone who just had one of the most disastrous um, presidential campaigns in modern history. Again, Kamala Harris entered that race perceived to be, you know, a, a very potent figure, um, was a completely toxic individual in terms of campaign structure and man, managing with staff. I mean, we had a, you know, lasted less than, than Tulsi Gabbard, who did not have a quarter, you know, anywhere near the financial resources and was just eviscerated on the primary debate stage by Tulsi, among others. Um, you know, they made the, the deliberate decision back then that they really didn't want a credible heir backing up Biden, given everything we know. And that is, again, part of the arrogance and hubris that has brought the Democratic Party to the situation. I'm certainly not going to be crying tears for the state that they find themselves in. Um, but again, it would be very interesting to see how this stuff plays out. And, and looking at, and just, just for our audience, just to understand, um, again, what are some firm deadlines here? Because um, the Democratic Convention um, is not still for some time, right? The, the convention itself uh, takes place August 19th. Um, I believe some states actually have legal deadlines for the ballot earlier on than I think Ohio, for example, has a pretty early um, ballot uh, qualifying for the ballot aspect to it. And so all of a sudden beyond, again, e- even if you want to suggest that, okay, well, you know, you go to a convention and, and things can happen at a convention and, you know, the rules can always be changed, things like that, that probably true to a certain extent there's start there, there, there's going to be you know i mean that's that's you know what you know, we're, we're about six six weeks away from ink being dried on ballots and that aspect of the equation and you know replacing <laughs> replacing a candidate over the course of six weeks um at the very least would be completely unprecedented in the modern era and again as, as someone who was on team chaos when it comes to the stability of the national regime um, you know, I'm, I'm very interested. I'll be, be having my popcorn seeing how they, how they try to figure this whole situation out. Well, we spent most of the time talking about Biden because it's just so shocking to just see how utterly unsuitable a candidate he really is. But the question is, um, looking at particulars in the debate, um, did, <laughs> did Trump do anything to help himself other than just look like he was paying attention? Did he have any brilliant moments during the debate? Or was this just really, hey, I'm not Joe Biden? Is that, <laughs> is that what Trump has going for him now? Or 
uh, are there some real policy issues that he could really still capitalize on? Well, policy was rather thin, and you know, and and, and one one thing that came up prior to it's something that he has leaned on into the conversation. I, I was interested to see if if he was going to play this up. Um, was there, there was some idea that he was going to interject cryptocurrency into the conversation? Um, not because I think Trump has a particular love of crypto, but because it's it's proving to be a very good donor base for him. Um, it's a way of him attracting a certain type of capital. Um, I, I think the more by uh, the more Trump views cryptocurrency as a useful tool for his campaign odds, I think that helps from a Swami in particular because uh, he has those connections with that industry. And again, if that if you're relying upon that as a source of of campaign finance. I mean, that's, that's, that's there's a play there. Um, so I got to, I think from each, but I, I think it was a good debate for Trump, not because of brilliant matters of substance, but for one, I think aesthetically it, it looked like 2016 Trump, not 2020 Trump. Like Trump was at his best when he was kind of a happy warrior. You know, he was, he was insulting people, right. You know, he, he was, he was, he was, you know, vulgar from, you know, traditional political perspectives, um, but you know, he, he kind of had this sort of alpha presence on, on the stage. And I think he, I think in part the, the rules of debate helped him, right. He couldn't speak over Joe the way that he probably would, would have liked to. I mean, there was a few times where, you know, he was trying to talk with the, the mic was off. So I think actually the, 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 the formal rules, the debate forced Trump to be more restrained Cl- very clearly. He was trained and he stayed on strategy, right. Where he tried to link every single question to the border and the economy. Um, which is what I would have if you know if I was in his ear, like that's the way that I've done it, right? So like that was that was smart. Um, you know, he made a big deal about um, just the 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 lack of respect internationally that um, uh, you know just the, just the, the pure optics of the of the, the weakness that America is projecting abor- abroad. Now again, we would have different characteristics on how much you project strength, but neither here nor there. I, I think, but I think those are three issues that average Americans, like non non you know flag waving Republicans. Um, do do feel in their gut that you know the economy's worse than what it was back in 2019, that uh, the foreign policy stuff is is a mess, and that immigration is out of control. And so he stayed very disciplined, keeping to those notes that remain positive to him. Um, again, if you're looking for a lot of you know great um, great critiques of the regime outside of these broader conversations of weaponization, I think you know Trump did a. You know, if, if you're looking for one kind of interesting point of substance, I mean, you did, we did get a, a brief, fun debate over the virtues of federalism when it came to abortion law and things like that. Um, you know, I'm not going to try to make that out to be anything more than it was, but, you know, at least that, that was one moment, you know, um, there where there's there's an element of substance that we got kind of cling on to. But I think it, it you know, these modern debates are not meant for big philosophical conversations. They're meant for respect for, for aesthetics and vibes. And I think Trump, regardless of Biden's performance, I think Trump had a strong performance relative to what we've seen in this stage in the past. It was much more like primary 2016 Trump than 2020 general election debate Trump. And so if you are, if you are on, if you're a Trump cheerleader, I think that you could be encouraged by that performance independent of the disaster of the Biden campaign to the extent that independent analysis is, is valid in a, in a head-to-head comparison. Well, perhaps this debate is an excellent demonstration of that old saying of never interrupt your opponent while he's making a mistake. Because you can imagine if Trump was actually talking over Biden during this debate, he would have actually saved Biden, mm-hmm. who uh, right, was just standing there silently staring into space um, and silence from Trump was clearly the best strategy in that situation. And, and, and the silent language, like the, the just just the the, the head to head comparison, right? And, and it was like, you know, like Trump, Trump, like the, the facial expressions, right? Like the yeah, 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 yeah you know, the, the the smirking, the, the the smiling again, like that was like Trump having fun mode again. Whereas Biden looked like a zombie with his mouth agape, you know, just kind of staring off into nothingness. And so again, this goes back to again like, the only comparison I think on this you know is you know, the 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 old JFK Nixon debate where again just the aesthetic if if, if you were in a, a a at a bar with a muted television it was very easy to come away with what was going on <laughs> and again I, I think that matters again I mean you know this this is the joys of democracy right you know the the, the aesthetics the the look the, the 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 lowest common denominator appeal is what wields power. 
Um, and from those measurements, um, you know, Trump looked like the alpha and Biden looked like someone who should be in a home. <laughs> the the Nixon uh, uh, Kennedy debate, quite quite an oddity by American standards. Um, Kennedy was in his 40s at the time. <laughs> we, don't, we don't let anyone in their 40s, anyone anywhere near power in America anymore. You got to be double that. Uh, and uh, so, yes, it's strange that they once let a man that young actually run for the presidency. Although I'm exaggerating because of the Cl Clinton and Gore were actually two guys in their 40s when they ran uh, in 1992. But you can imagine that if you had someone that age on stage with someone like Biden or Trump, just how very different uh, that would look. But that's clearly not the way we're doing things with this generation. But uh, as uh, one person I know uses the phrase, the biological solution will soon um, solve that problem with, with a lot of these people. So it'll be a very different situation uh, in five years, and we'll, we'll see how things uh, look then. Well, we better go ahead and wrap up this episode of Radio Rothbard. Um, the, with the race heating up, I think we'll have more to discuss along these lines uh, in the future. It, it may be fun just to let a few weeks go by and see what the blowback has been after this uh, debate and, and really return to the topic. So we'll be back next week with another episode of Radio Rothbard, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>